So before I get into, into the talk, let me say a little bit about APG. So firstly, APG is the largest professional geological society in the world. It's obviously very much focused on oil and gas. Uh, members all over, all over the world and increasingly looking to move outside of its sort of North, North American heritage. So the plan is that I'm the first of what will be an annual series of distinguished lecturers. So every year there will be someone with a different topic coming through Africa for on a two to three week tour. Um, lots of benefits to, to joining APG, um, technical publications, conferences and so on. And for the students in the audience, the real sort of no-brainer is that basically it's free to join. So if you apply <laughs> online, you tick the box that says I would like Chevron to pay my fees, and then basically that, that's it, you're done. So, um, so certainly as a student, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great way of finding out more about oil and gas and getting an idea about where that might be in terms of careers. Okay, so let, let's move on to my talk. So what I'm going to focus on about is basically sort of using outcrop observations to understand the oil and gas reservoirs. Um, and we've been using um, you know, outcrops for a long time to, to understand geology in general. Um, but one thing we can do now, which we couldn't do a few decades ago, was build numerical models based on outcrops and simulate how fluids move to rocks. And that gives us a way of, of, of um, talking and interacting with, with others, things like petroleum engineering, who routinely look at fluid flow and fluid behaviour, but maybe aren't quite so aware about the role that geology might have on controlling aspects of fluid flow. Um, so the, the work I'm going to show you is it's not just mine, there's a whole bunch of people, these are collaborators from Imperial College at various times. I work with lots of people outside of the college, and obviously the sponsors here provided funding and lots of, lots of great technical insight as well over uh, almost 20 years now. Okay, so this, um, this slide here gives you an idea about the problem. So, so typically, um, typically this is the kind of data we're working with in, um, to try and make a geological interpretation of the subsurface. We have a what shown schematically is a 3D cube of, 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 of seismic data showing the, 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 the real data from the back here. That gives us full coverage of, of, of the subsurface but at a fairly low resolution. Um, so you can kind of get a broad brush picture of what's in the subsurface. But within the reservoir itself we need to know more detail and that really comes from wells. Um, here you're showing three wells just schematically. You might record one on logs and core through those. But that's really not a lot of data. And then we might take geological concepts based on what we see in the, in the data we have available to us. We make an interpretation of that at a conceptual level. We then start building numerical models, and they start off labeled here as petrophysical, so really more geological models looking at properties like velocity and permeability, which are functions of the rock. Um, those models have computational limitations, so often they look like a rather crude representation of our concepts. And then once we come to flow simulate those models and um, try and model how fluids move through the rocks, um, well that's more computationally intensive. So the grid cells in here are larger, um, there are fewer of them, that's because we need computational power to solve the governing equations of the flow. Um, and it's just, this slide really sort of says in text what I've just talked to you, but maybe the key thing is these bullet points at the bottom. So again, 3D science data can sample all the reservoir but at low resolution. But once we're talking about wells, you know, logs, cores, we're really sampling at just a tiny fraction, you know, a fraction of a fraction of 1% of what's actually in the ground. And we're usually trying to build quite complicated interpretations from that very sparse sampling. And that's really where um, outcrops and ideas from outcrops help us to give us ideas to fill in those, those gaps between the wells. The last thing here is that once we actually have some production data from these reservoirs, where well, then we can actually know something about how the fluids have moved. We know you've put a certain amount of oil or water into one well and out of another well. We know how those are, you know, we record measurements of those wells, which is real, and we can use that also to start to constrain geological models. Okay, so, so part of the solution then is, is to look at outcrops. Um, and you know, that's, that's really the, really the main rationale for taking petroleum geologists out in the field anywhere is to get you know, good understanding of basic geological concepts, which allow them to make predictions laterally. Um, so kind of away from where you might have this information in a well. 
and an appropriate scale to uh, appropriate scale to um, to really resolve below what we can see in the side of the And again, a new thing we can do here is we can build numerical models from these sort of observations and, and test test the impact of the geology in a way that we couldn't do 20, 30 years ago. Um, so what I'm going to do to begin with, I'm, I'm going to show you um, um, the group I'm working as one of a number, maybe one of 10, 15 throughout the world, who, who take outcrop data, build these sort of numerical models, and then fly simulate them. So I'll talk a bit about you know, what some of the key steps that we follow in building those models. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight some of them. So the, the ones which are more geological, because that's really my background. You know, what, what are the geological inputs which are really key to building these sort of models? Um, a little bit about the different tools which are available to, to build the models and the impact they have. Um, using the models as experiments, which is often something that's not really done in industry, there's the sort of tighter deadlines and constraints on how the models are used. And the difficulty then is taking a step back to think about different interpretations and how they might look in these sort of models. And then I'll finish up by, by talking about you know, comparison to real data from real reservoirs. So I'm going to show you quite a few examples, but uh, to keep things relatively sort of simple and coherent, I'm going to really focus on examples from shallow marine rocks. Um, so here you're looking at two correlations through, through, between two wells, so sort of the gamma-ray curves and here are the same. Remember the sandstones with the gamma curves off to the left in the two wells. You just take a simple correlation here, you can call it as a series of layers. Um, but a more geological interpretation would be that those layers are different. And these, these dips might reflect at the front of a delta or a shore face as it, as it builds out from left to right. And you can see that you know, if you're trying to say predict fluid flow between these two wells, these two models, these two interpretations, you can expect to have very different outcomes. Uh, all the sands are connected between the wells in this interpretation, so you should recover most of the oil that you're trying to produce. Uh, nice simple flow patterns. Here there are pinch outs and, and changes in fashions um, within the sandstones between the wells. So you'd expect them to be more complicated, more complex patterns of recovery of the oil and, and the way the oil is swept out in the sandstones between the wells. <coughs> but there are still a whole series of other questions you might ask about here. So this is schematically showing that there are, there are shales in this medium grey colour in between the sandstones. Well, are they present everywhere? Are they continuous? Um, are there any channels that might get into the top of this succession? If this is a delta front, then we'd expect there to be channels that feed that delta and they would cut down from the top of this succession and potentially join up sound bodies that might otherwise be unconnected. Um, and of course, in an engineering sense, we can put more wells in here, we can produce those wells at different rates. And what's the impact on that in terms of how many people like cover from a, a reservoir like this? So those are some of the questions I'll try and answer as we go through the talk. And I'm going to show you um, examples um, mainly from outcrops from the, the, uh, the um, Cretaceous uh, Western Interior Seaway, so basically the central part of the US uh, around Utah and Colorado. Um, the two images here are basically kind of stratigraphic cross sections from landward to seaward for a large um, shallow marine system, um, a series of stacked delta, delta air units. Green is coastal plain, the yellows are shallow marine sand bodies and the, and the, the greys into the offshore shells. And this top cartoon shows a kind of a very simplified view of the, of the geology of the topography in those rocks. The bottom picture shows a more sort of realistic view of the geology, which is based on a lot more work in terms of outcrop mapping that, these guys have done, I can't claim to have done most of this geological characterization myself. But what you can see here is that this simplified diagram shows a number of fairly continuous, lightly extensive shell marine sandstones. The bottom two are shown in a bit more detail in here. That's everything that the one at the front belongs to this lower sheet in here, everything that the two at the bit front belongs to this one in here. And you see all, all of the, um, the letters A, B, C, D, E. Those are different, essentially different delta loads which are stacked laterally to each other at roughly the same kind of level in the topography. And I mean, this looks pretty terrifying if you're trying to you know, reconstruct that. It, it, it looks complicated. And we also have channelized sand bodies in red in here, so there's more complications. 
Well, this is, this is, I guess, a rather simplified view, but closer to the real geology. So, so one kind of way of approaching this geologically is to sort of construct the conceptual framework with the different scales of heterogeneity, um, the sort of complexities in the rock, uh, kind of how they're arranged in space at different length scales and how those different length scales relate to each other. And that's important because we, you know, in any sort of model, we can't represent everything as accurately as we would like. We're going to have to choose the scales we want to represent. And we're going to have to be aware about what we're not representing, say, at smaller scales or at larger scales. And that requires a good conceptual understanding to make that decision. So this, this sort of pretty complicated series of cartoons are basically showing the arrangement of, of, of stratigraphic and sedimentological heterogeneities going from big scale at the top down to small scale at the bottom. So you've got a map on the left and a cross section on the right. The cross section on the right is showing sandstone bodies stacked in this kind of fairly simple sheet like representation at a big scale. And in map view, this is a sort of bulge of sand, which is, which is our delta system. If you zoom into that, we can see that each of these sheets is in fact made up of a number of smaller bodies. And in map view, those are distinct lobes, which sort of switch about their position in, in, in 3D. If we zoom into this, then it's, this isn't just you know, uniform sand. It's made up of a series of different fashions. So the changes from, from dark gray through light gray, orange and yellow, those basically indicate uh, sort of increasing grain size, increasing sand content, and, and by implication, higher porosities and permeability as we go towards the warmer colours. And again, if we take one of these lobes and look in detail, and you know, those fashions are arranged in a certain pattern in plan view. And if we look at one fashion, say, in detail, and this, this, this grey one for, as an example, it's made of interbedded sandstones and shales at, at bed scale. And again, there might be variations of that scale that are important. And then even smaller scale, we can pick out structures within beds and even down to four scale. But one, one advantage of putting together this sort of conceptual scheme is we can now decide, well, okay, you want to really want to test heterogeneity at this scale. These dipping surfaces is important. Uh, we have, we're not going to represent the smaller scales, or at least not, not directly. We can maybe represent them indirectly. And maybe this is, what, this is what we want to capture, then that might constrain the fact we can't represent the big scale features um, like in the top part of this hierarchy here. Okay, so that, that's great conceptually, what do the rocks actually look like? Um, so this is, a, this is the same map I showed you in an earlier photo. But in this case, you can see a number of what look to be rather sort of sheet-like sandstones over this over the field of view in here. And that cliff face at the top is about 30 metres. So you're looking at those sandstones extending laterally for about 300 to 400 meters. Where is this? This is, this, this is in, uh, in central Utah in the US. And these are Cretaceous rocks, a unit called the Ferran sandstone. Um, so what we're seeing here is, you know, we're seeing this sort of layering that corresponds to this pattern here. Maybe a, the, you can kind of see this, the, the style of layering is there, and a little bit on the cliff face, that partly reflecting this. <coughs> This lateral stacking of load, but I'll, I'll show you a bit more of that in the next slide. Okay, so to zoom in, um, zoom in more detail again, just to get your eye in here, we've seen the same, well, two of the same layers of sandstone in here, um, but we can obviously see more detail within those ledges that look fairly distinct from the large distance. So each one of those has a share of those. We get progressively sandier upwards uh, towards the top, and then there's another shale at that level which again then gets progressively sandier upwards. But within there you can see there's lots, you know, that's not a single wall of sandstone, there are thin shale intervals all the way through there. And if you trace out those shale intervals, they basically define, in this lower package, you're defining beds between from top right down to bottom left. So these are these dipping time form surfaces um, in the cartoon. So this lower pack, this lower ledge in here, is, is, this is a delta load. The, load. the delta load is building out from right to left across that slide. The other thing you can maybe see in here, the same sort of level, is this sort of blocky orange weathering sandstone. And if you trace it out, you can see it's defining a defining channel. Um, now, that channel must be trending out towards you or into, into the screen away from you. 
And that channel basically is, is oriented in the wrong direction to be feeding this out of the world. The channel that feeds that devil of missile off to the right and be feeding sediment towards the left. This must be feeding sediment either into the, into the board or out of the board to a separate down the road. So we're already getting a sense in the app that there's a complex 3D arrangement of these, of these different probes. Okay, we can see that even smaller scale, and once we get to um, again to small scale flashes, we can see there are thinly bedded sandstones and shales. If those shales are continuous laterally, then that will indicate very low permeability um, vertically. And if flow vertically, we'd have to pass through those continuous shale beds, and that's, that's pretty unlikely because there are gaps, holes in the shales where the sandstones are connected. And we can see that even further in sea structures and beds. So that's maybe gives you, hope, gives you an idea about why it's important to think about these different scales of heterogeneity and how we go about trying to conceptualize that. Yeah, this, the other thing that's important, I've mentioned 3D already, but in terms of taking out, you know, picking out crops to take apart in detail as sort of representative of a particular depositional system, we need 3D exposures. And the map on the right here is showing. Um, in black is the outline of cliff faces within a, an area that's about, um, about 8 kilometers by 5 kilometers. The cliff faces I've shown you so far have all been around, around here, but those cliff faces extend in a series of branching canyons that give us some 3D control and we can start to put together at least the bigger features in, in 3D. And to give you a sense of that, here's a series of maps of that, that, um, that study area. So we did in the in the box in here. And the maps go from the kind of oldest part of the figure three and work kind of each row down towards the right before jumping down to the next row. And we can basically map out rows at, at multiple different levels. So if I start here, which is the first row where you see some prominent sandstones in the sort of yellow and, and, and orange colours. That load is building out from bottom right towards top left. The next load here is basically building out from right to left. The next load here is building out from, from bottom to top, and it has this kind of fork geometry and plan view. And the next load is also building from, from, from base to top, but it, it, it's sort of confined. The, the white area here indicates that the pitch out of that delta load laterally and, and no thickness. So again, the key thing here is having the data really put things together in 3D. Um, and even though we have great outcrop data, there's still uncertainty. There are still features that we can't confidently correlate between the cliff faces or characterize because they're, they're smaller than the space in between the cliff faces, for example. So one case would be channelized sand bodies. So the top image here is uninterpreted. There are two delta lobes at different levels. These two sand bodies in here with a shell between them. And over here is, there's, a, there's a channel sand body coming down to the top of that upper um, upper delta load in it. And so representation in a, in a model here, the different colours in here represent well, the greys, the shale in between the two sand bodies, and here's, here's the chain in it. Um, and there's uncertainty, you can say, about the, the, the geometry, the, the continuity of that channelised sand body. Even in outcrop data, in, if you're looking at the subsurface as well data, the low side resolution, that uncertainty becomes much, much more pronounced. Um, Okay, the other thing here, there are sort of different modeling tools available to us to build these models. And I'm sort of conscious this is probably something you've not necessarily come across before, but um, anyone building these sort of models in, in, um, in industry or in academia, that they have a, a kind of a choice of algorithms they can use. And it's not clear which one is the right one to use. So one, one aspect of the work we do is to, is to say, build reference models where we, we take our best like something close to a truth case based on lots of outcrop data. Then we sample that data as we might do in a certain subsurface, so take out eight or nine wells, or synthetic wells, and then build models that try and you know, match up those well data using different algorithms. Um, and here you're seeing an example, the top one here, SCGM, it's essentially it's a, it's a sort of propriety, company propriety technique that sort of builds synthetic seismic data and then tries to invert that. So 
it matches the uh, it matches the reference model pretty well. It, it does less well. It, it does a bust between the the sample data in the wells and the, uh, and the overall volume of, of, of the model. And that, that's that's quite common in reality. This middle line in here is basically SINSIM is a variogram based method. It's the most common and the most the most established way of building these models. The fascist patterns in here, well you can see they're not they don't look wildly different to what's up here, but one they look much more speckly, much more broken up. And that has implications because the fascists in here aren't, aren't continuous, you know, and that have an impact on um, said that retaining continuous features that might be conduits or barriers to flow. And the bottom one here, NPS stands for multiple point statistics, which is sort of a it's kind of a hot new technique and, and been available commercially for about five years. It does a good job of, of capturing lateral continuity. You can see that you know, the patterns in here are a pretty good match to our reference case. Um, but it does less good at, at capturing some of the basic input data, like the proportions of different fascias along the wells. So none of these techniques are perfect, but you, know, you get an idea by, by building models of different techniques about what the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, um, you know, one of the things that we've worked on, because we don't really feel happy with any of these techniques, is to try building new techniques. Or, uh, and one of the ones we've been working on is, is basically building models around surfaces. So the conventional way of building models is, is, at this time, is to take a grid. That's often orthogonal because that's easier to solve the flow. The, the flow equations become easier. Um, but geology doesn't come in nice Lego block size rectangles. Okay? Uh, and you know, any geologists out in the field, they'll start sketching and they'll have you know, relationships based around surfaces. Um, so that's the direction that you've taken in here. So this is an example of a surface construct of using an algorithm of, a, uh, of one of these delta, delta top uh, and delta low surfaces. So here's the delta top in here, in, in the, the purple color. The colors indicate sort of height below a reference point. So there's a sloping surface outwards, which is the the delta from final form down to the basin floor in red. And we can take multiple surfaces, we can place them in a, in a way which is geologically consistent uh, with, with, with concepts, and we can also condition their space into um, the data we collect from outcrops, like the ones I've just shown you, where we can measure the space into the final forms. And then we can build the grid around these surfaces. Um, um, what that means is the geology is sort of hardwired into the models rather than having to and represent models of the geology on a, more, on a basic grid framework, which isn't really very conducive to capturing uh, that geology. And to give you an example of that, from the, again from this Cretaceous Delta system, here's, here's this um, part of that model I was, of that area I was showing before, just under a kilometre by three kilometres. There's a the digital elevation model in the background, just a sort of context to show us we have data on cliff faces in here that we've used model and there's a, a slice of here for the 3D model volume showing fashion distributions. And if you take a cross section say from proximal, so the inner part of the low to the outer part of the low, that's what this is showing here. So the different colours of different fashion belts and the black lines are basically prior from stratigraphic surfaces. And this sort of distribution of pattern and sort of down out and, and sort of the spacing of the surfaces is it's qualitatively similar to what we see at the outcrop, and it's quantitatively used as the same statistics that we've measured from the outcrop to do that. Um, okay, so the next thing is, you know, these, once we build these models, they're useful experimental tools. And I would say in many ways, um, that's, that's really the most, the most fun part, is that you know, we, we recognise that there's different interpretations of any geological data set, and you can start to ask what-if questions about what, what really matters in this case, they're understanding fluid flow in hydrocarbon reservoirs. So here's an example of, of four different models. Again, just 2D slices to a 3D model volume. The top row is built using one modeling technique. OBM is object-based modeling. Again, that's a very common industry standard technique. And the bottom one is, is, is very grand technique, which again is the other sort of real standard uh, in industry. So the different rows are built with different algorithms. The models on the left, we, we're making interpretation of no channels. The models on the right are making interpretation that there are channels cutting down from a certain level within the model. And then we can flow simulate. 
And I'll show you a number of flow simulations with the same sort of color scheme. So here we're, we're sort of injecting water in, in blue on the top right of the model, and we're producing oil, producing red from the bottom left of the model. Um, I'm going to sort of gloss over some of the technicalities in terms of what, what properties we've assigned for different colored fashions, but the key thing here is that these top two models, that are, you know, this technique allows us to retain connectivity between the yellow bodies and between the yellow and the red bodies, which are the most permeable. And essentially, because we retain that geological connectivity because of the use of white algorithm, these predictions of the sweep look rather similar to each other. We just preserve um, continuous highways of fluid to move through by using that, that, that technique. This bottom technique, the fact that you know, there's a more speckled appearance of the fascias and things are more broken up, that means we don't, we can't, we're not seeing the same sort of sweep and, and um, the water's not really contacting this part of the model as a result. It's, it's stopping where things break down by using this algorithm. But if, if you put a channel in, well, that we start to join up things which are otherwise and connect and see that, that, that sweep quite nice. Um, so I'm going to show you a few examples of using these tools experimentally. I mentioned earlier that the channels is, is quite a common uncertainty, even, even with great outcrops, the channels are often smaller than the, the, the distance we're trying to call at the moment. Um, so here's a map view uh, of two models, one in which we have a channel which is feeding a delta lobe, and the interpretation here is that, that the channel is feeding that lobe, it's a, it's a distributed channel and it terminates at the apex of that delta lobe. And that's a perfectly valid geological interpretation. You see, we've got, we've got no data in this region at the top, so we can't test whether the channel extends to the north, so it extends to the top or, or not. And that, that's perfectly valid with what the data we've got. This bottom model is showing that the, the channel which basically extends further through here. Again, it's largely consistent with the data. Um, and it, it would be a reasonable interpretation that this channel is feeding a lobe somewhere off the top of the, of the board. And you can see it, you know, we're injecting water in blue on the top right face, producing oil on the bottom left. And you know, it's pretty obvious the difference between those. Where this channel extends through here, it has a higher probability, it allows water to move through really quickly. We leave large patches of oil behind and we have a poor recovery or poor prediction of sweep and recovery in that, in that reservoir model. Now that, that again is sort of fairly predictable. You, you know, most petroleum geologists might expect that. We can now take the same model with a continuous channel and play about with the, the, with the, with the permeability properties we assign to the channel. So this bottom model, we, 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 give, we give the, the channel the same permeability as the yellow rocks that, which it cuts into. And then, as we move towards the top of here, we either we double the permeability in the channel or we multiply it by five. And you know, this effect of, of the water flowing through this, the channel as a, as a permeability highway becomes more pronounced as we increase the permeability, which again is, is fairly obvious. Okay, now, this, this graph here shows the result, the result of a similar kind of a, a suite of experiments around the ones I just talked about. So the vertical scale here is because recovery or really how much of the oil we swept out by injecting water into that top right face of the model. The different columns are for different uh, geological interpretations or scenarios which are hardwired into the model. And it's, it's, the, it's the sort of the white spots which are the ones which are important because they're, they're showing the sweep direction which, I, which I've shown you in the, in the earlier slide. So this, this first column here is basically for a channel which terminates at the end, the apex of the delta lobe, so it's not continuous across the model volume, and we have a relatively low recovery. We take a more continuous channel, but with a relatively low permeability of, of similar order to the other rocks in the model, our recovery increases. If we then have a higher recovery in the channel, well, the so a higher permeability in the channel, the recovery drops down, and if we increase the, the permeability even further, the recovery drops even faster. Now, one thing from here is, you know, we're seeing the same result in terms of recovery for two different models with very different sort of geological assumptions behind them. And the take-home home, the take -home message from this is often these production data, recovery here being a, recovery factor here being an example of that, there's not a unique geological solution to a particular um, set of data collected in that way. 
And that's often problematic because you know, it takes a lot of time to build these sort of models using the sort of software we currently have. And generally speaking, people only build one or a handful of models, or at least the, the geological assumptions behind the models are, are fairly limited in range. And it may well be that they're not really capturing the full range of behaviours, or they're not recognising there could be other ways of explaining a particular result. And that then leads to poor predictability in practice. Okay, so other things which might be important, well I mentioned you know, we've seen these different fineform surfaces in here, and you might expect if those are covered in shale or cement, those would be important barriers to flow laterally and also vertically. Um, and of course, we, we see pictures here through two models, basically showing um, water saturation as, as we sweep oil, sorry, sweep water in from the right, produce oil to the left. The top model is for delta low weight with no barriers along those dipping surfaces, and the bottom model shows barriers in black along those surfaces. And again, this is fairly self-evident. If you put in these dipping barriers, they tend to trap oil and lead behind them that all doesn't get swept out the, um, the left-hand side. Um, but we can do more with, you know, by using these tools experimentally. We can start to vary the, the proportion of barrier on the, on the surfaces in a systematic way. And we can also vary the spacing of those surfaces in a systematic way and look at the impact. And that's what this graph is here is showing. So the vertical axis, again, is, is the change in recovery factor, how much of the oil we're, we're pushing through to the production well on the left-hand side. The horizontal scale is, is showing a, essentially a barrier coverage, how much shale we, we, we put along the surfaces. And the three different curves are the different spacings. So closely spaced in black and then more widely spaced in grey between those surfaces. And the key thing here is that really, you know, those three curves are pretty, you know, pretty much similar to each other until you get to about 60% coverage of barriers along the climate forms. So in other words, if, you, if you're developing a reservoir on the subsurface, um, and you think there's a relatively low proportion of shale or cement along those surfaces, it's really not worth investing lots of time and effort to produce a model that captures something down here. But it becomes important once you start to capture something up in here. So over, over 70, 60, 70% 70 of barrier coverage, these, these are quite different predictions, and there's, there's quite a large range of, of recoveries which, which would equate ultimately to um, profits. So that, that's, the, that's the stage at which it is worth focusing attention and effort on this kind of heterogeneity. Um, I also mentioned you know, the vertical versus horizontal permeability. This control by these thin decayed sandstones and shales. And this is too small to represent it explicitly in the models I've shown you. you know, we, we can't build in shales and sandstones at centimetre spacing without having you know, a gazillion grid blocks, which is just not, not practical. Um, but we can, we can estimate uh, the, the ratio of vertical to horizontal permeability in this, in this fashion. If these shells are extensive, that, that ratio is zero. Effectively, there's no way for the fluids to flow vertically. The other extreme would be for some holes in here, then a common value that's used in, in, in practice for these sort of fashion is, is 0.1. So the vertical permeability is a tenth of that of the horizontal permeability. Um, so to show you the impact of varying that parameter here, Again, two cross sections through two models, but with different things shown uh, in the different rows in here. So, this is the basic model. We've got several stacked delta lobes, um, each with a, with a gray flashes at the base, orange at the top, and with these different climate surfaces with barriers in, in black there. So, that's our first lobe, our second one in here, our third one over in here. The models on the right, we just put a channel in that cuts into the top of that sort of thing. Now, the two images here are basically showing what happens once you want to push water from essentially from behind the screen towards you. Um, in this case, the grey flashes we're saying have zero vertical permeability. That's our thinning embedded sandstone and shale flashes. And it's fairly intuitive what happens. You know, we sweep out and water moves through with the orange and the red flashes in here, and everything in the grey is effectively left in the top. Now the bottom image shows the same models, but in this case we've assigned you know, there is some vertical permeability, and it's a tenth of the horizontal permeability in that grey fashions. So what you can see is we're starting to see much more blue and, and, and yellow in here is sweeping out some of that oil from that fashions. 
really around you know, the, the orange is forming the, sort of the highways for the flow, but that flow is also moving to some of the surrounding grey areas. And there's an interesting contrast between the two models. By adding a channel in here, we're actually getting more oil out of that grey fascia. And that's because the water we push through in that channel, it, it slumps under gravity, it moves downwards, and it starts to displace oil out of the, the grey area underneath the channel. And that's an effect we've ever seen here. So we also start to see interactions of the effects of different heterogeneities, which becomes quite non-intuitive. You know, it's, it's very straightforward to think about the effects of one heterogeneity, but once you start to combine them, it's much more difficult to make predictions. Okay, so I, I've shown you lots of models which are theoretical, based on outcrops, and make predictions from those models, but I've not shown you any data from real reservoirs. So that's the last, the last thing I'm going to talk about here is you know, actually using this to diagnose something in, in, a, in a real reservoir about the subsurface geology. So these are two these are sections of two models, one, um, both channel marine uh, models. The top one has dipping surfaces in it, or barrels along dipping surfaces, and the bottom one doesn't. So the different colours in here show different water saturations. Blues again, um, lots of water swept out, and then the the yellows and, and, and oranges, most of the, most oil, most of the oil still unswept by the water. You know, the, the model without the barriers behaves in a nice simple layer cake way, mirroring the fascia's belts. Put the layers in and it's much more compact to hand. Now the, this, this plot on the, on the right, which I'm afraid is a bit busy, it basically shows the data from, from one well through the other. So the central column which is covered is showing the fashions along that, that well. And this, this is a model built from, from outcrops, I should have said. Uh, so the fashions go from grey through orange into, into red, and that is basically an upward increase in the, the sound content and, and the porosity of those fashions. And there are also distinct barriers along these red surfaces which correspond, coincide with these different surfaces. Now, the curves, or the data points on the right of here show the sort of predictions of pressure data in the reservoir um, for different proportions of barrier along those dipping surfaces. So there's a third point of Susan Fox in here, which line, which line a nice simple line. Um, so the, the pressure is basically following one nice uniform gradient, and that would be the case if you had a well in this model in here. The set of, of, of darker blue crosses in here, that basically corresponds to um, putting 70% barriers along those kind of forms. And you can see that now that barrier coverage is not really enough to give any sort of real break in that pressure trend. Everything looks to lie on the same line. But if you put in 90% barrier along those kind of forms, then you see distinct jumps in the pressure. Pressure is being held up between compartments in the reservoir which are bounded by those dipping surfaces. Okay, now the curves on the right show water saturation. So that, that's, the, that's what's shown here in the coloured color cross sections. That's how much water is in place in a certain level in the reservoir after we've, after we've um, pushed water through and tried to produce oil. And again, the sort of faint turquoise curve, that's basically the case of this lower model. You know, no complexity and a nice simple pattern. If we add 70% barriers along those climate forms, you get this dashed line. So you can see there is some, there's, there's some effects. There's a kind of a bit of a zigzag pattern, particularly across these climate forms. And if you add 90% barriers along those climate forms, we're seeing you know, very pronounced sort of zigzag effects, very pronounced changes in, in saturation across those boundaries. So we're now, now, we're now making some specific predictions about what you might see with 70% and 90% barrier coverage along surfaces. So now to some real, some real data. So I'm going to take you offshore, uh, offshore North East Scotland to look at um, part, of the, a, a part of a reservoir in Brentfield. So this is a, a field which, uh, which contains um, almost 3 billion barrels of oil in place. You know, so it's well into its production now, it's almost abandoned, but it's still pretty significant in terms of um, economics. This, this map is a map that's shown the top of the field. It's, it's, it's rather simple structurally. It's a, it's a tilted fault block. Um, the main fault bounding structure is the ones north-south, and the, the um, east-west faults are the northern and southern tips of, of, of the, of the um, fault block, and the fault block is rotated down <coughs> towards the left. So there's a series of water injecting wells in here that push oil up towards the crest, the structural crest of the field, um, and, that, and this is a nice kind of, it's a nice light oil, so we'd expect to have a nice, simple, 
kind of display, a nice sort of simple piston type displacement of, of water pushing the oil towards the well. I'm going to show you data from a cross section also from one well that's built after almost 20 years of production in that reservoir. Um, before I do that, let me show you some pressure data from the reservoir. And the, the interval of interest is really just this lower part. What's labeled here is this, this four, the lowest part of the reservoir. Uh, and you can see pressure data here on the left. And the key thing is in that interval, everything plots on one nice line. Okay, so there's, no, there's nothing in the pressure data to say that, that the fluids are moving in a different way because of the geology. In terms of what the rocks look like, um, well, in a cord well in this reservoir, um, well, there's a core description in, in here, these different colours again, different, different fascias, and again we go from the kind of grey, yellow to, to red, indicating that we're increasing sand content and porosity permeability. There's a gamma ray curve in here, there's some, there's some spikes in here which are concentrations of heavy minerals, and also often cemented up. So this is, this is an example of one piece in the core, this sort of rather a diffuse looking cemented layer containing heavy minerals that are rather small and line between the other grains. It has a nice clear effect on the wine line rock. So, so we, can, we can at least identify them and try and correlate them. And there are also intervals of shale, typically a bit lower down, but a less distinct kind of character in the wine line rocks. So we know there are things in a vertical succession which might have low permeability. And this next slide shows a correlation um, between four different wells and the long and structural crest of the reservoir. So each of the wells shown there, each well has three different curves, a gamma ray log, a neutron density log. The key thing here is essentially that um, these, are all, these curves are all shown to change from shale and getting progressively sandier and more porous. And these, break, these, these subtle sort of kicks in gamma ray, we can trace those out and they're in this case, we have to force the interpretation on, but the interpretation is dipping gently as these cliniform surfaces. Now, this well on the far right hand side, this is the well taking the data plate after 20 years of production. And when this well was drilled, these were the fluids that were collected in, in, along the, on the well wall. So, green, green is basically unswept, the oil is still in place, and blue is where the oil has been swept out. And you can see you have this alternation between oil, water, oil, water, oil. And those breaks in saturation coincide with these what are interpretably dipping surfaces. So the implication is, well, we might not see this, this effect in pressure data, but it's there in the saturation data. And that implies that these surfaces have some, sort, some form of permeability barrier along between 70 and 90% of their extent. That's a prediction we can make and, and sort of from our, our app crop models, and it, it, it's sort of borne out or matches with the production data. Okay, so it's another example from a second but somewhat similar reservoir. So, um, sorry, this is the only seismic data I'm going to show you. <laughs> so, you're looking at a cross section here um, across a Jurassic reservoir off the southern coast of England, um, a field called the Rich Farm Field. And the reservoir interval is sort of in this area, in this, this sort of level in here. Maybe you can make out there's some subtly dipping reflectors. It's easier, it's easier to see in the interpretive version, but they, all, they always are. Um, but you know, you can pick out these white lines, there are some different surfaces in there. And if you take a time slice at that level and image it in map view, this is what we see. So that, you know, there's a structural grain trending from left to right. You see black lines in here are faults. There's also, there's also sort of stripes running from top to bottom, showing in white in here. And those white lines correspond in cross section to these different surfaces. So we can seismic image planiforms in this, in this reservoir, but at, at a fairly coarse scale. And again, I'm going to show you data from this well in here, which is down in here. That well was drilled after 12 years of production from this reservoir. Again, it's a nice, simple tilted fault block, a nice light oil, so in many ways, very similar to the last example I've just shown. What does the rocks look like in core? Well, it's a pretty biodivated silty sandstone. It gets sandier upwards. But the real standout is that there are cemented beds, um, sort of metre to two metre spacing, pretty much continuously throughout the succession. And that's what those look like in, in, in core, these, these sort of paler, grey coloured cemented intervals. Often they're occurring along the concentrations of shell beds, um, so essentially the shells are washed in by storms um, along the, the front of the, of the delta, um, along those pine form surfaces. And then in early, in early diagenesis, that they get cemented up to form these, these bands. 
Um, and if we look at data from this well that's been produced in 12 years, that's, that's, that's what this well, that's, that's the data from this well. And the gamma ray curve in here, and basically neutron density and sonic curves in here. Uh, the key thing is that you know, these, these gray bands in here where, um, where we interpret these, these um, cemented pairs to be based on core and wireline log data. They stand out from the wireline log because of sonic really nicely. And this, this last box in here is showing pressure data. And initially the reservoir was all the pressures in the reservoir along this, this sort of dashed line in here, one nice simple trend. And what you can see here is that you know that there are bits of that trend still present but displaced to the left, and there are lots of breaks in pressure. So again, the implications of those barriers are extensive over at least 90% of those tipping surfaces, or at least many of them. In this case, we can we can check that against outcrops just um, about 40 kilometers along the coast. That is this reservoir outcrops along the coast. And you can see these cemented beds forming you know, very lovely continuous features in the cliff face there. The cliff face is that for what is high in And the climiforms are dipping out towards you. So this is sort of a strike stage. So in this case, everything fits together really nicely. Prediction, subsurface data, and then sort of ground truth again with more accurate data. OK, so I, I, I've, sort of, I've talked through sort of some of the things I've, I've I hope that I will explain. So, you know, why it's important to categorize children at different scales and put it into a hierarchy that explains how those different scales relate to each other. Using models as, as experimental tools. Um, and then also, ultimately, if we flow simulate those models, we can get kind of predictions we can test against subsurface data and diagnose aspects of subsurface flow. So, my last sort of few slides are maybe, maybe kind of where some of the future directions. So, um, there's probably, there's probably two or three of you in, in the audience who've you, if you built med, reservoir models in Petrel or GoCab or IRPIMS, the sort of commercially available software, and you'll know it's a fairly long and painful process. And the models I've shown you were, were built by, most of them by PhD students, and they, each model probably took you know, five, six months of work. So, you know, not, not a trivial task to build these models. Um, and that means there's a limited number of models you can build. There's a limited number of things you can do to investigate. And that, that's quite limited. So one thing we're doing is, is, is developing a, a tool with various collaborators at Harry Watt and Calgary University and then um, various industry collaborators as well to do basically build something which is more of a prototyping tool for reservoir models, to build them, sketch something, build them quickly, do some nice simple calculations or flow simulations to see what matters and then focus attention where it's really needed for, for more detailed, bigger models. Um, so hopefully this animation is going to work now. This, um, okay. So what you're seeing here is, uh, is Daisy, one of the current PhD students. She's got a conceptual model there. It's actually a, a submarine channel filled with a channel levees, sheets at the bottom and a um, a mass transport complex below there. She's just, she's just drawing on tablets um, using a stylus. This is all in, in real time. You can maybe see that now she's sketched that sort of corrugated surface at the bottom. And there it is in a 3D model. It's just extruded from 2D to 3D. Um, and there's a grid representing that surface. And now she's doing the same thing for some of the overlying surfaces. Um, there's a the surface. Um, adding more detail in here. And, you know, just by, by way of kind of Contract. If you were trying to do something like this, okay, so this is a very simplistic thing, um, the illustration of TV really, but this would take an inordinate amount of time, you know, this would be several hours of work at least to do something like this in, in a commercial software package. And as you hopefully see, in two or three minutes, Davies constructed something which is a, a 3D representation of a TV sketch, captures a concept, and we can calculate, for example, um, yeah. You can calculate something about connectivity, for example. You can run simple flow simulations on that. And we can do all this pretty much on the fly. So that, that, that's one thing we're working on, is just, just making this whole process a bit more simple. But again, in, in, as a way of promoting experiments, really, rather than sort of lots of detailed work. So the other thing I'm showing you here, and this, this is really um, this is really my colleague Matt, Matt Jackson who's sort of driving this, but I'm, I'm the geologist in making sure that it doesn't just become an exercise in, uh, in computational physics. Um, it's to build basically different flow simulators. 
So for a long time, the reason for using orthogonal grids is because it's easy to solve the flow equations in, in three orthogonal directions. And that's been a limited step in terms of how geological models are built as well. But we're now able, you know, we maybe can now move away from that sort of uh, um, that limit. Um, there are other ways of flowing, solving the flow equation. And therefore, we can we can start using grids that are much more flexible in how they're built. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, they can also change in time. So again, it's a bit of a cartoon illustration. We've got channels, different sinuosities. The blue ones are very permeable. The, uh, the orange and reds are less permeable. Um, and you see already that you know, these aren't built with rectangles. You're seeing triangles and tetrahedra in here. Um, the, the, the interesting thing in here is that um, we're going to flow simulate and again inject water at the bottom right and move it towards the left. And what you'll see in here is the grid is crawling with the time steps. So you see these high permeability channels are being picked out. Where, where the stream looks very blue, that's where we have a change in saturation from water to oil. Lots of computational power needed there in the grid to basically solve the flow equations. But the grid is coarsening behind those, um, those saturation fronts because we don't need the same degree of computational power. So, that, you know, so we, we win in two ways in this, essentially. We, we can firstly represent geometries much more accurately because we're not tied to orthogonal grids. Um, but also, if the grid changes through time, we can solve the flow equations more, more efficiently and, and can save computer effort in time. So, I mean, this is, this is a simulator we're working on um, in, in the college, but um, I mean, there's lots of other companies thinking the same kind of ideas. Uh, I, I sort of predict within sort of 10, 15 years, we won't, we won't be seeing the same kind of models as we currently have out of commercial systems. Okay, so just to sort of to conclude then, um, so I hope I've, I've demonstrated that the outputs are very important. I mean, that, that in some ways, that they're almost the first key step of this, is having an idea about the geology you want to represent in the model. And that means a nice, clear geological interpretation of the recognition of alternative interpretations. Um, we can use models as, as, as experiments. That's happening in defining capsule flow patterns and then sort of identifying things we can really identify in the subsurface. So for petroleum engineers, for example, we can start to tell them things to look for in monitoring the reservoir that might you know, tie into the geological interpretations. And this hopefully will all get much easier and much more geological as we have kind of better tools to, to do this kind of work. Okay, thanks.